Welcome. This is the August 30th Jail and Zones call. We have Daniel, Jan, and John, and myself, Michael. Others will probably trickle in. And I have some Euro BeehiveCon news as of about yesterday. I have confirmation on a room, and there was discussion last week about having a session focusing on just testing in preparation for the upcoming FreeBSD 14 release. So Santiago and myself should be able to provide remote lab access. And Jan, as I recall, you either might have on-site hardware or something remote. Or at least yourself. Um, I have an old, for its time, pretty beefy server uh, co-located in a hack space. Okay. The internet connectivity isn't the best, but it's there. Uh, you can, I can mess with it. What generation CPU? Uh, Sandy Birch uh, dual eight core Xeon with hyper threading and 192 gigs of RAM. Okay. Any exotic NICs or other devices given that? Not really. Super hot topic. Broadcom mass only one gig. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> Understood. Um, Unless I get someone to press the power button, I'm a bit storage limited because the j -Bot has no out-of-band management. <laughs> and I can't justify running it 24-7. Fair enough. Noted. But. Okay, totally random question while we ease into this. It came up. Does anyone recall the open ZFS 2.2 schedule? It came up in the last leadership call and... Right, will come up later today on the production user call. Maybe I'll nudge Alan. So let's see. Uh, in case he doesn't show up, thank you, Jamie, for looking at the manual page updates. That is awesome. They are in. Thank you, Dan Langell, for reviewing that. And does anyone have topics before Jan, you share your findings on Jailing Beehive? Well, what have you found? So uh, I wanted to run Beehive inside of a jail. And in theory, that is supported. But the complication uh, is that I want the jail to only have access to the minimum set of device nodes it requires. So that, for example, it can't access the other uh, come target layer ports to access disks it shouldn't um, so that different beehive guests are properly isolated by jails so I had to dynamically generate the devfs rule set which is a bit under documented but it works and the next thing after all was that as soon as I disabled IPv4 and IPv6 both so no version of IP enabled inside the jail. Beehive failed to initialize the top device. So as long as it has either IPv4 or IPv6, it works. As is, I looked into the code and found out that it uses a socket, an IP socket, to set the top interface link up in case you haven't uh, set the SysCTL to have top devices come up as soon as they are opened. So th this code can't work without an IP socket. But it turns out there is an IOctal on the top device which does the same thing. So a little 10 line patch is enough to simplify the code. So the resulting code is shorter, requires fewer system calls and uh, yeah, it works without IP sockets. Oh, so the patch that, will indeed be a workaround, correct? No, the patch is uh, an improvement upon what is there because top devices are special in that way you have a file descriptor for the interface. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to address it by interface index or name and then set the basically set link state up using an interface request and then you basically t tell the kernel the network interface with this index uh, apply these flags to using an octal on the socket and without a socket you can't do that but you can do it directly on the top device file descriptor that is already open 
using an other octal to do the same thing. Okay. Multiple ways to skin a cat. What form does that patch take at this very moment? Um, Napkin notes? Unstaged changes in my local Git repository. Okay. Now, so it's a trivial change. I looked at the 14 the zero code and it's the same in this regard, so it would require the same like 10 line diff. Well, uh, yeah. feel free to get that out in the open when you feel exactly it's ready. Uh, awesome. Thank you. It was too late to, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, not necessarily. Just get it on the on no, no, radar, uh, I'm sure. That I would trust myself to write this up. Well, uh, uh, it was 3 a.m. when I woke Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. So, okay. That is great news. And uh, um, did you discover anything else while jailing Beehive? Yes. Uh, I found out that uh, in 13.2, as expected, the uh, um, splitting the uh, boot ROM into the code and the variable files works. Uh, it's a very good use case for uh, the 13.2. Uh, feature addition that is uh, mounting a single file using nullfs so that right. i can have a very small read only uh, zfs clone of a read only snapshot and so on yes uh, with only beehive in it and then basically mount the configuration file and and the, the uefi variables file into the um Read only file system. And the variables file can be read only once it's configured? Uh, you wouldn't want to do that because, the, for example, the guest is allowed to uh, use it to update its uh, boot order, for example. Right. So do you have to handle it separately on a write yeah, it's, file system? Yes, but only a single file modified in place so none of the problems uh, happen, which are common with updating configuration files where you try to write out a temporary file and then atomically rename it mm -hmm. because this file is just modified in place. It works. That is awesome. Yeah. And if yeah. you completely isolate networking in the jail, was it, would you then pass through a hardware device to the VM or how would you network? No, the VM? um, the VM is connected using the top character device. Okay. So the the jail has no access to the IP stack, but it does have access to a single top device. Okay. That's the configuration I found out works. So basically, the Beehive uh, user space process yep. has no access to the network unless it knows how to inject Ethernet frames into the bridge through the top device, but you can't just create a socket. You would basically have to run an IP stack on a top device to uh, access the network, which is a pretty tight isolation against uh, guest escape attacks. Because the recent Security patches uh, reminded me that it was worth looking into. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Any other lessons to share? Um, yeah, I have to review? clean up my that is uh, awesome. shell scripts to uh, dynamically create a come target layer port, assign a worldwide port number to it, make it available to the DevFS rule set and so on so that I don't have any hard-coded uh, port numbers or um, other things in there. So, and that okay. the Hive guest has only access to the uh, LANs it should be able to see and not to all of them. So similar uh, to what I've already done with my S6RC and Ansible stuff just this time in, from a jail.conf and with uh, BinSH. So very cool. To share. And if if that's it, I have a perfect segue question if that works for you. Sure. So the next cloud AIO image that requires system D and Docker, et cetera, and works quite well on a Debian no cloud VM image. Uh, 
really, really wants a reverse proxy and external let's encrypt. And I have been discussing with folks if that is possible using a jail that would satisfy those requirements so that you can use it on the LAN without it knowing about the outside world, despite it really, really wanting um, to know about the outside what, world. Any thoughts okay, how, probably it probably is which uh, web server does it use? Nginx? I believe it's Nginx. Uh, okay, in that case, you lucked out. Okay, in that case, right? you lucked out because um, Nginx can bind an HTTP or HTTPS service mm -hmm. to a Unix domain socket. Okay. And HA proxy uh, can forward requests to a Unix domain socket so that you can use a Unix domain socket to make uh, the service available so that okay. the jail running, so I'm assuming you're running the Linux uh, appliance image or whatever you want to call it uh, as a Linux for later jail? No, if that that's the dream, but uh, the reliance on system D and PID1 is problematic oh. such that doing it in a VM so image is a workaround. Okay, in that so case, beehive you can't plus... use a Unix socket like oh, that. Sure. Oh, okay. Because uh, those Unix sockets can't work across uh, virtual machine boundaries. There's no VirtIO socket. <laughs> Uh, there is, I've talked about it with I of VSOC, but it's not there. Yeah. Uh, not in Beehive, at least. Okay. But there is no reason why you can't use uh, a tab interface with uh, just link local IPv6. So Correct. you have. A, don't put the VM on a. Uh, the top interface on the Beehive host in any bridge, just have a link local address on each side and then use HA proxy to the link local address or whatever you want to use. Because of IPv6 scoping, it's still properly isolated, can't be addressed from off link. There are only two IP sticks on the link, the host and the Beehive guest. And that's with or without a tap device? This would be with a, with a top device, no, with, okay. but the top device would have only an IPv6 link local address on it. And inside the uh, virtual machine, you would also only assign an IPv6 link local address because of the IPv6 link local uh, scoping to the link. You can't route to it. It can't route to the outside world because it doesn't have a source address. And so basically it's properly isolated by design. And then if it wants a valid uh, SSL certificate, uh, then it, you would a have to CA and just in a Petri dish say, hey, this is valid. Have a nice day. No, uh, you would uh, proxy the HTTP request from the CA. So let's encrypt zero SSL or whatever. Uh, through your load balancer to the uh, appliance. Got it. Um, the, so basically, the what is a dot well known slash Ahmed challenge or something, mm -hmm. and just this path using on port eighty from the externally. The problem is that for that to work, you have to have a externally resolvable host name. That's precisely the challenge that got got me here. Like, can and we do that all in a petri so, dish? But. The thing is, you don't have to use it to access it. Instead, what you can do is uh, you only assign this somewhere and only proxy the port 80 validation requests, basically, but the challenge and ch response to the challenge from the... Mm -hmm. okay. So that, yeah. So all what that has to work is the that the CA right. can send an HTTP GET request to certain uh, URLs under the well-known prefix. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, so I mean, since this is the jail call, I, I think it's uh, I think it's worth asking why do you want to use the Nextcloud AIO version? Because Nextcloud is 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 perfectly functional in a jail, except for 
uh so you, you know the the, the one wanna... yeah the, exactly the colabora uh so what what do they call it the next cloud office which is in the aio is an isolated docker it's not even in, in the aio they're all <laughs> split they're all separate they're all separate entities so if you you had an x cloud including the terminator uh so just a uh, I mean, it would it would require custom installation, but only the first time. So once you once you do that, and then you have it in a, a um, in a ZFS volume, you have something much more portable than the Nextcloud AIO is uh, in in FreeBSD land. And the only and 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 you could, I mean, I assume that you want to deploy this on on many individual machine so so there is a little bit of coordination with making sure that the you know the uh the next cloud uh mm -hmm. the next cloud office is is easily resolvable between you know be between the between the devices wherever you're you're setting up but but this sure. would be you know i mean for for me it's just a transplant of i do my next cloud template plus the I mean, I, I I share most of my next five offices, right? Um, including just because Collabra it's, it's one or not. That's what that's what Collabra is. Next cloud office is Collabra. It's yeah. It's simply they're they're yeah, and it it doesn't it doesn't have a unique version of that. It's just they just changed the name of their uh what what is it called the next cloud app from uh, Code Collabra to Next Cloud Office. And then that's just a community version of Collabra. Okay, so the, the online editing like this Google Doc we're on is now available in the FreeBSD version. Well, so that that eyes on the piece, prize is that that piece. Yeah. No. So that yeah that that piece is still is in is in Beehive, but everything else here, which which also means that your data is in a jail. Uh, and then you know you don't have to worry about any of the any of the Linux stuff. The only Linux thing that you have to worry about is is what Nextcloud AIO is doing anyway, which is communicating from the Nextcloud core okay. to to this Linux container. So you um, split which, out which Nextcloud could, Office only. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it's already it, AIO is already doing that. It already has multiple containers for, for right. that. So what difference does it make if the whole thing is in if the whole thing's in a beehive, then then it's a little less less portable than if mm -hmm. if all of the next cloud data. Now now it's an active Daniel. connection. So the the Collabra is an active is an active connection. It doesn't store any content in it. It's just Correct. so it's it's basic. Yeah, so it's basically just an just an application, and those are those are portable and replaceable and. You know, if if one of them breaks, then you can point it at docs.dexter.com or whatever, sure. whatever whatever you've got. So those, you know, those so so to to jail Beehive the entire thing uh, for for that one missing Linux piece uh, seems like uh, seems like more effort than it's worth. And and now you know you're talking to to Jan. And I, I've I've dealt with this before also. Like dealing with the Terminator and stuff like that, you can make a jail that's got all that you know that's got all that package. Whether you do it over over DNS or port eighty or 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 whatever, you can make something much better than the next cloud AIO in a jail. Let's I do it like if you to, see a path um, to get the Collabor office. Go ahead, Jan. The problem I see with um, this Daniel because I would really like to agree with you, but you are then take on the responsibility of updating all of the beer, uh, the jails and maintaining all of this, which if you're prepared to do that, that's a valid solution and the better solution. But the temptation of just running the virtual machine is that basically you can hope that you can just accept the, their appliance and that it doesn't explode in your face too often instead of having to maintain it yourself. So you're suggesting that you don't have to maintain a Docker host? 
and no, you don't I'm have to run as security suggesting patches that on if it. You had, and, uh, no, he's not saying plans. that. It has its own updater <laughs> that does its thing, yeah. and it. But more, it doesn't do the base work. system, so you still you you still have to maintain that that instance that that you know you you can't. I don't think that it would be considered good practice to not run security updates on the on the oh, Linux. No, he's not suggesting that. He's, yes. he's one of my, our most fastidious. What I'm what I'm I guess not clear on is exactly how can we isolate the interactive Collabra components that are Docker based, and would they be their own VM despite the rest of Nextcloud being independent on a, in a jail? Yeah, yeah, okay. for for sure. But you okay. can you can distribute a worldwide network of those it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be one to one so if you have a client that has a thousand nextcloud deployments i mean you wouldn't need it but let's let's imagine that they did you could still use one collabora that wouldn't okay there'd be no no it's just an it's just a little app server it's it's totally sure. disposable i have i have i have one of each client and if you know for, for for whatever reason, we move some we move some jails around. Oh no, that that um, collaborator is not working. We'll just point it towards another one or the other client. So what mine. you're arguing is that this is a stateless application. The document exists inside of Nextcloud, and every time someone opens it, uh, the document is sent to the uh, session, and it only exists in memory while the session is running. That's a hundred percent true, and exactly you know, so that, that's true for all the as well. Exactly. So all of the stuff that Nextcloud AIO, AIO does is second best to what what you know you you would define and 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 create in a jail that would take you about as long as it would take to iron out uh, these you know. The, these complexities with with getting the parts working in a jail that you want to work in jail. So uh, yeah, so I, I that's 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 my thought. Now, of course, my bias as a you know as a you know an MSP and budding uh, you know private cloud provider is is that you know I do want to to see the guts if something's going to run. Nginx, I want to run Nginx and make sure that it's, you know, that it's configured exactly the way I want. Amen. I do, uh, I do certs with DNS. I do, you know, I, I do things a little bit differently than they're going to want. And Michael, you do have to make that terminator. So if it's, if you, if you have a single next cloud jail, that's already your terminator. You don't need another, yeah. Amen. you don't need to oh, solve the terminator problem. Have you documented your steps in setting up just the dedicated Collabra application engine, wherever it may happen to be? Guessing in a VM. Well, that's I mean that's that's on yeah that's on Collabra site, but the but the fun part there is that you follow the the process once, and then you have have you know Amen. and then you oh, have wow. a, a Zval. So. And because so you don't, that you might do be higher again. CPU, you might indeed want a dedicated server that's crunching on that and nothing else. And amen. I, I sounds I, great. Thank I would you. say that you definitely you definitely want it in a yeah, since that's uh Collabra is definitely server side. So having that in a VM, and and this might be a post hack just a justification, but having that in a VM is a good idea because then you can you can more easily control. The amount of CPU and memory that it's that it's gobbling up. Yep. Um, where where Nextcloud is just a PHP application, all those tunables are are documented from here to the moon. Absolutely. Um, but I think that this is such a useful thing that we should make a FreeBSD Nextcloud AIO jail kit, uh, um, and and that would be. And that is something that would be worth it to me to to invest in because we we do we create next clouds, you know, I mean, at least monthly. Um, so I would I would you know I I would sponsor and and have staff to uh, you know to make it so that you run these two scripts and then you have a next cloud. 
Um, I, I, uh, so ahead, yeah, uh, for the pod jail manager, there's the basically the equivalent of Docker Hub called uh, Potluck. Right. Uh, yeah. Bastille BSD they already also have supports it, right? these templating mechanisms. So modern common jail managers do support the mechanisms to have the equivalent of a Docker file or a pre uh, compiled uh, image. Which you could just drop. The and problem is that that right. you have to have all of the state. Uh, of course, in theory, you could out store your state, uh, mostly at least uh, your files inside an S3 service or something. So you would have min.io so that you don't have them um, directly in the file system. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could take it. We could take it pretty, pretty far. But you know, I think if we if we if we had a a, a jail base, uh, mm -hmm. here's how to decide what uh, you know what host name to put on this thing, and then um, you know, and then here's here's the Beehive volume, and here's how you point to it, and and you have you have that few step process. I think we could make documentation that's way shorter than the how to set up Nextcloud AIO documentation. And 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 deploy, you know, hundreds a day if we wanted to. Sure, you can do that using Ansible Pal until uh, you get bored of it. <laughs> right. I mean, simply you could do it with... splatting it in a VM image and off it goes. No, and... Yeah, I mean, and... yeah, just a just a no yeah Z, a CFS replication. You you don't even have to you don't even have to have software outside of base and do it. Um, which I, you know, which is another bias of mine because I want a blank host and, uh, as the yeah. host and, for your jails and virtual machines. Right. Yeah. So basically it's, I mean, I use, I, I use salt just because, you know, a contractor I used suggested it and that's, that's what I have. Yeah. So I install, uh, you know, some some light tools and and my so, and my own scripts. But I I could run everything that I have on all of my hosts with FreeBSD base. Yeah, I normally install Python so that I can use Ansible, and then yeah, I'm off to the races. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, everybody says that I should be using multiple tools including ansible so maybe i maybe i do need no, to you don't get need up to speed ansible on that. if you are, are comfortable with salt stick they solve almost the same problem in a slightly oh. different way so salt stack is a bit has a bit of a st steeper learning curve because you have to have them agent uh, master and minions and so on whereas Ansible piggybacks on SSH. Odd. All true, but a tad orthogonal. So that said, is it a decent observation that any application hub should be in fact jail and beehive aware because there might be some pretty tight interaction between jails um, and VMs? Not really because a, a flexible enough uh, jail manager could have beehive jails. Absolutely, and that was a punchline there, so, of my yeah. offline online. The, the Beehive is just a special case yep. because it's on the edge of what you can do inside of a jail and requires more than most jail managers can offer you at least without dropping into basically writing a configuration file. Yep. Bypassing the jail manager because you have to expose device nodes and uh hook into the network you, but yeah Jan I hope your napkin notes from your previous comments on Beehive in a Jail will be in better shape for Portugal and we can look at that hands yeah, on I hope I get them into the at least a blog post until then but yeah no promises okay but hands on we can that's, explore that's really exciting like. work and so, um, to do that, I moved away from my purely routed setup, created a bridge on the host, and then joined the Beehive tab interface as a member interface to the bridge. 
and then it just worked as you would expect a bridged beehive host to work. Yeah. Which you have kindly documented. Okay. So I already have a human friendly shell script to create the CTL uh, port and the expose ZFS volumes as a CTL SCSI devices. Yep. Excellent. But that could need, uh, use a little polishing so that there are symbolic names used instead of requiring the user to specify the port number in the configuration file. Okay, got speed with so that. Would, yeah. In the spirit of segues, Daniel, does this uh, inspire anything you've done similarly? I think that the share. only, uh, yeah, I guess we, you, you and I were trying to, uh, and we, 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 we got, we got pretty far though. Though Jan actually knows how and why <laughs> he got it, he got it to work. Um, but I think, I think we got, we got similarly far with, uh, with, with Beehive in, in jail. Um, if, if I can ask an annoying uh, question that. That one percent of the, uh, you know, one percent of one percent of FreeBSD uh, users will care about. Um, I could use a net graph socket instead of a uh, tap, right? And it would it would basically function as as you described, Jan, right? Um, yes, that. you. But wait, uh, I'm not certain if net graph. How NetGraph interacts with jails and VNet. So it, the problem it's, here it's is funny because it's. I think the problem would be, but I haven't checked that you would basically be told inside the jail that you don't have access either because of lack of permission or because the host claims to not know the pro address firmly. So the problem would be creating the NetGraph socket. Uh, you want to use inside uh, of the uh, jail. So because normally, unless you, there may be a p jail parameter to basically allow unrestrictive access to, but normally I think jails are restricted in which address families uh, and protocol families they can use. Right. So that, for example, yeah. you can't open an, I don't know, IPX Apple Talk socket in old versions, which supported those. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Because those, those yeah, I, protocols weren't jail aware. I might give that a spin just to see what but what happens and what breaks. I'm if curious. you set the uh, interesting, so you must not use alias jails or VNet, but if you just set the network stack to inherit, I don't know which restrictions apply because I haven't tested that. Right. I mean, I guess I could use an EI face device instead of a tap um, as just inside the jail. And then my question is, why are you using neighbor. NetGraph for this? I know that you figured it I, all out how it works, and it, it was a bit of work to figure out, but what are the advantages? For, oh, you mean for jailing a for jailing Beehive or for jails? No, jail? for Why using NetGraph? Uh, NetGraph for um, Beehive uh, network connectivity. I mean, Why I do guess, you want to I use a NetGraph socket okay, instead of a top interface? For for Beehive, but for Beehive in general and sure. its communication with jails, I get I get improved perform. I get significantly faster communication between at least between uh, uh, devices on the same host when I use netgraph sockets instead of netgraph sockets to EI face netgraph EI face and uh, for VNet jails I get uh, significantly faster communication uh, um, what are you seeing uh, what, what numbers uh, sorry, it's been it's it's been a minute, but there is a there is a Clara blog post where they do a where they do a quick comparison um, on a 
on a you know on systems that that are using um, IF bridge versus NetGraph, and there's an improvement. I thought but I thought we've had this. The, those we were this before sure we the bridge driver was rewritten to make you the no, epoch. No. Uh, this no, is John. Sure. Do you welcome, John? Would you mind posting a sample of your setup? That might be the easiest way for us. I'm I'm sorry. I'm listen, trying to listen to both sides of this, and as a fly on the wall, and I'm thinking maybe just a quick sample example of your setup might help um, solve some of the the discussion. Sorry, I'll I'll Don't hush up. Sorry, no, no, that's exactly. Yeah, I'm about it. to ask what our fly on the wall has to say and share. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, do you have syntax handy? And I know we haven't, we, it's deep in the notes is some of this, but you know, let's give, put some fresh eyes on this notion. So I use, yeah, I use my own, I use my own homegrown scripts. And then I, you know what, actually, if I just, if I just paste the, Please do. the net graph, yeah, yeah the, the net graph output, uh, or, you know, just an active, you know, let me find an ugly one. Thank you. Can you share the dot file with us? Oh so, yeah, or, yeah, I can do or that the, too. Or just the SVG or PNG of it? Um, yeah, actually, I actually have mermaid sketches available of all these. Because um, I would be interested in how you plucked it together. Um, actually, let me let me do that because then I can just I can. I think I have that in my um, my documentation. Yeah, well, I guess I'm, I'd be leaking some private IPs. Uh, are you like, sharing the screen right now, or, or are we still? No, no, no. I was just going to send a. I was just going to send a screenshot. Yeah. And if you want to. Sh not share your screen, that's also an option. I just wanted to obfuscate some IPs. Please do. And can I can I drag a picture into chat? Would that work? Boy, um, can you Skype it to me and I can drop it in? Uh, I don't know you if that can, will support uh... that. So you can try it. I do see. There's a, some notion of files. So yeah, try it. John, any questions or other news yeah. while he's doing that? Oh, I see something coming. There we go. Yeah, so oh, the pretty pictures. All right, nice. so this the cylinders, yeah, the cylinders are VMs. The triangles are real interfaces, one with an IP, one without. And then the trapezoid is a is a virtual um a virtual interface. And I can I can show you what that looks like in um you know with the ng control list also. But these are the the um the what do you call it? The ovals are EI face devices, yep. and those are all VNet jails. And then the cylinders are net graph sockets. Um, and those are those are beehive. Um, one connected directly to a uh, physical interface and one connected to a virtual interface. Um, and then the all of the jails are connected to physical um, physical interfaces. And then there's the um, yeah, and anyway, I do get I do get improved communication between 
the ones that are on the same on the same bridge versus versus IF bridge. And this is this is recent. This is definitely not uh, that there. I remember all the news about massively increased bridge performance, and it's still faster. Um, I I'd have to race them, and I'd have to do that on a on a good machine because I think my last set of metrics were on a uh, you know on a pretty slow machine so i'd like mm. to I'd, I'd like to see the difference there um and what version of previous but, yeah is that? Well, this is 13 2. got it no, um, no fresh great okay yeah yeah i try to keep them up to date um so so uh what are we doing it's show or list i forget the diamonds or jails the diamonds are the those bridges. are physical interfaces. Okay, yeah, okay. those are the right. The they're bridges to yeah. That's that's exactly correct, Jan. It's it's their their um, interfaces. Uh, their 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 net graph bridges on physical interfaces where the trapezoid is a net graph a virtual net yeah. graph bridge with a. Um, so what's a bit an, confusing yeah. is that you have directional errors in here while it is definitely. Oh yeah, no, that's, unidirectional that's, that's incorrect. <laughs> or under, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. There's the, the direction. I, I think the, the, the host, that's just the host name. Uh, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. actually, the host doesn't even need to be present here um, or there shouldn't nope. be, I, I guess the reason why I have lines is because I needed to say what the bridge, um, what the interface names were. Um, uh, and but then basically uh, you uh, would have the interfaces, I don't know the exact uh, node type, but there's a net graph node type, which if it's kernel module is loaded, it creates one instance for every uh, normal network stack interface. And then you have a hook to uh, take the packets in and out. Uh, which is uh, how you get access to the raw Ethernet frames for net graph bridging. Is it NGE face or something? Uh, EI face is the, oh, yeah, is the e one that works in field. John, does this paint a picture for you? Having requested this. No, this is not the one not I'm Jan, looking Jan. for. <laughs> NG Ether, I think, is the one I am I meant. Oh, NG Ether. NG Ether is for attaching to physical interfaces. Exactly. It's how you uh what you hook into the bridge. As right. So if you interface. take a look at I've uh I've let my little um that's the output of my little um Ooh. And with tracker utility, and uh, yeah, so I use upper, upper, lower to um, using the uh, ng ether um, on the uh, mm -hmm. yeah on the on the public and private uh, interfaces. Yeah, on the physical interfaces, that, uh, you use ng ether to connect them to a net graph. Yeah, when the other reasons I was attracted to mm -hmm. it is I feel like uh, with, with systems with very large numbers of jails, having uh, the separate side of the e-pair um, on, on the host uh, gets gets unwieldy, which NetGraph deals with it switching um, invisibly. Uh, so you, you don't see the, you don't see the yeah, two parts of there. until you which, dump which, the uh, graph. Uh, what do you mean? I I, I mean, like um, the, if, if you dump the net graph uh, graph as dot file or something, then you get uh, spam with your whole internal network topology. Right, but it does still doesn't. You don't. You still don't. You you still see the um. Yeah, it's magical. Use, it's out of use, the way. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. But when you use epair. The you know the, yeah. the second the second interface just exists on the host or the you know the, the top jail or or whatever all of that all all of that's yep. 
visually available. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know. It's, I, I find it, I find it significantly more work to, to manage. And I, I realize that a lot of people use jail managers where it doesn't matter, but if there's improved speed and it's got, and it's cleaner to, uh, to, to manage that's, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I guess until, until you pair and tap, uh, have equal or outperform net graph, I don't see a particular reason why not to use it. Um, I'm surprised that net graph outperforms the normal network stack for you. Um, I do like net graph for its flexibility, but I have found that it doesn't scale well because of a topology log. And it doesn't scale. Know, so, so you think that, so you think that it, uh, with large so numbers of. With high packet with large... rates per bridge, you will run into problems, at least when I tested it. Because could each. You, could you say that? So if you have lots of bridges, because you have lots of small to medium tenants and that's your use case, then it will just work. But if you have high packet rates on a single bridge, then NetGraph, at least in my experiments, which are also a bit dated, does not scale well with the number of cores because just like the old bridge driver, uh, it has a single lock in the data path, which has to be held to protect the ARP table, basically. So hmm. All right, that, that sounds that sounds like it could be a that sounds like it could be a problem. So how could I how could I exploit that weakness and and see it in, in a benchmark? Um, basically, throw lots of packets at the bridge. Just lots of small packets and then run it on a fast desktop CPU and see it outperform the biggest server you have because uh, the highly clocked desktop CPU has a higher single thread throughput than your behemoth dual socket epic server. Yeah. That's interesting. At least that's was maybe it has gotten the epoch rewrite as well. In that case, great. Uh, and I missed it, but maybe we should. Yeah, someone should really spend the time and effort. Someone else <laughs> writing all of these regression tests for performance characteristics. Well, that's precisely a goal that he has fun is to map out some of this and. But yeah, it's it's really early days. So um, there was a talk at last year's UBSD con by an open BSD to, uh, uh, about basically they have the company he works for runs the service internally, but the results are publicly available where we basically track the performance of different open BSD commits uh, on a collection of hardware. Basically, they are just uh, they run the OpenBSD current and run a bunch of networking benchmarks. Is that out it? of Genoa with all of them? Yes. Maybe? Yes. And you can see, the, oh, we have this new security feature. Oh, it costs us 15% forwarding rate. Oh, we fixed that. It's now half a percent. So, and you can see the, oh, we move this out of under the giant lock. We got another 5% throughput. Yes. And you can basically see it over time how the forwarding rate and other metrics develop. Uh, but that's uh, really a, something you can't do in your home lab, especially not for years on end, but requires someone to pick up the hosting bill and... Um, pay someone to babysit this. Yep. Uh, again, John, unless you've been dragged away by a call, does this answer the questions you had? You had requested that Daniel share his syntax and pretty pictures. Yeah, I, it, it, thank you very much. It's very appreciated. It makes a bit more sense.
It yeah, looks like you know, Clara's article is specifically about Beehive, but uh, but they they show the 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 basic commands to to make a switch work, um, and then with with the jails, you would just create a. Um, um, is that this article create on the a screen? new. Yeah, I just okay. I, yeah, we both. Yeah, oh, we did. Okay, I just that's pasted that's it. That's um, that's so cool. yeah, and then and then you would just create. Uh, if you if you create an EI face and link it to a switch, even if that EI face becomes buried in a jail, it, it still communicates with the with the switch. So um, that uh, oh, what they're measuring is something completely different from what I'm doing and recommending. They measured uh, the non net graph version. They used a net graph bridge and then basically hooked it the top device back into the bridge, which of course uh, that's slow because you're going in and out of net graph all the time. Oh, so you're saying that. So what we're doing here under performance for benchmarking, we ran a basic test using iperf three. Okay, same basic test I ran uh, with top and IF bridge. That's about six point seven. Yeah, my system's a bit faster, but yeah, and seven point five with net graph. Okay, nice. But yeah, combining the net graph bridge with a tap, of course, is a terrible idea. Because then you have the tap, I don't think it's which is, I don't think it's suggesting. I don't think it's suggesting that. It's saying tap and IF bridge versus an NG sock, which is exactly the, the NG one socket, gigabit a second the, like, difference, but using. don't uh, mix and match incorrectly because then you only get three point five. That sounds realistic. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. I've yeah, I, when I was when I was in transition between e pair e pair and tap mm -hmm. and and net graph i did have some hybrid systems and i can i can say that the the, yeah, the they run at about half was speed. obvious yeah it was awful yeah it's really bad well half speed isn't the worst you can encounter using this kind of thing <laughs> no forgetting to turn off lro because uh, net graph does not automatically <laughs> uh, turn off lro uh that is a significantly worse <laughs> oh problem. yes that's um why is my SSH lagging? <laughs> Kinds of bad. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, something else well, to look I'm out gonna... for. Is you really don't want. Yeah, gonna... uh... Yep. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was I was just going to say that I'm going to you know now, now that I sort of understand and the the potential pitfalls of this, I'm going to you know. Uh, try to find a more saturated machine and then and then compare them with a you know with a large production system model with the with a you know ten or twenty actually yep. maybe twenty or forty but, uh, VMs and VMs and jails and see what happens exactly and there you would basically want the problem with uh, according to my understanding the problem with the bridge drivers that while the bridge driver uh, has been basically unlocked to a degree that it scales almost linearly to reasonable core counts is that what it doesn't scale well is the e-pair driver of all things. This simple virtual driver uses a single thread for the packet forwarding. It doesn't do much in it, but it's not, yeah, but it's a single queue virtual device. Are you so, and you're positing that that there's one you know there's one core per e pair, but there's one still thread, a yeah. single a single flat lock for netgraph probably. Yeah, but so if you and something to watch out for is what you're measuring. Are you measuring the throughput of a single flow, or of a whole bridge under lots of flows? Right. Okay. Because running one i per even with a few connection. All you're exercising is one path with a few flows. What you, for a realistic production workload, unless you have a very unusual production traffic, uh, is uh, that you would have to have load on all ports at the same time on your bridges. 
Right. But that yeah. could totally happen with the, you know, with the, especially with the, with the most. So it's definitely something to think about. But if you have, let's say, only 90% of the throughput for the, for a single flow, but you can have that same throughput for dozens of flows at the same time instead of only for one. And it's not so clear cut which is better. Yeah. Well, this is yet another reminder that testing on a couple of crappy desktops is not the same as testing on my production servers. So and we'll testing right on under that. realistic <laughs> load. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and it's ironic that the gaming desktop with a say five gigahertz might clobber your servers because they're often you know focusing on multi-core. So yeah, yeah and, keep that uh, in perspective. If you have code paths which don't scale well with more cores and have workloads which fit into the caches then you get a very lopsided result on a fast desktop because there you push the CPUs well beyond the point of diminishing returns for single thread performance. Uh, while the server can't afford to do that and has to run at like two thirds of a single core clock speed. And oftentimes you have less cache capacity per a core and so on. There should be a bandwidth uh, testing kit that's that's suited for, you know, uh, this this type of, you know, multi yeah. uh, multi guest environment so that I so that I could, I mean I guess I'm gonna have to invent something like that if I well, I'm probably yeah. one of the one of the tiny percentage of the population that cares about such things. And the other problem is that oftentimes you're not really interested in just peak throughput on the network, but also the distribution of latency. Right. So because if you have something like a next cloud with another microservice or not so microservice over there and so on, uh, every time you take a hop, even through your virtual network, you have a chance to encounter the tail of your latency distribution until basically you're expected to have every user request face the 99% percentile of worst case latency or something, or worse. On such as, so if you have your VNet jail running your database here, your memcached or Redis here, your, and so on. And to make matters worse, especially if you have good caches with high hit rates, they can trigger pathological networking problems. For example, there's this really neat write-up, uh, I don't have a link ready, uh, about where Facebook, of all people, uh, suffered from this because they improved their memcache defog ever more and their latency problems just got worse despite having ever better benchmark results in their memcached until they understood that they were suffering from a um, in-cast collapse where basically they sent lots of requests to all their caches and then the top of rack switch uh, overflowed the buffers because all of the caches answered at the same time leading to packet loss. Hmm. So, and you can create similar things in virtual networks. That's really interesting. All right, so uh, let's make a jail go as fast. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, so Daniel. to to make a jail to make a jail go as fast as humanly possible, uh, we still are want to stick with uh, uh, the latest and grand, greatest IF bridge and uh, mm -hmm. and and eat and eat pairs in your estimation. 
No, it's well, not. I guess Gia actually, Kant. an alias. Yeah, an alias, and actually, actually, an alias would be an by alias far the fastest, is the fastest choice. Right? Or the really the fastest is just to inherit the full unrestrictive network stack. An alias is right. almost as fast, and oftentimes good enough um, to provide the level of fidelity to your uh, jailed workload it expects, because most applications don't want to change the network stack at one time. Why should your database, your cache, uh, your file storage, whatever, where should they reconfigure the IP addresses at runtime? They shouldn't even be running with the permissions inside the jail, which would allow a process outside of a jail to change the network stack configuration. Right. So yeah, I, I, I keep my balancers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I keep my balancers and my, so, yeah, my public facing machines and, uh, you know, Varnish, what? et cetera, on, on aliases. There's just no point in using VNet for that. Exactly. Uh, what I found works really well is to have a dedicated HA proxy jail as an alias or inherit and only jailed for management purposes, which then uh, basically has a directory and the inside this directory there are, is one directory per jail on the same host and the services inside the jails bind Unix sockets in their Unix stream sockets. So something like an Nginx or yeah. Postgres. I do exactly, ever, if, yeah, I do exactly the same thing. This gives the best performance. It also avoids all of the TCP congestion control issues because you no longer have congestion with the stream within the same kernel. So basically, if the buffer is right. full, you know which thread has to wake up to consume because it's blocking on a read on the socket. Using uh, what strategy? Yeah. So basically, you have your um, load balancer jail yeah. binding the TCP services and maybe also handling TLS termination. But you don't want to have plain text flowing over the loopback where someone may run TCP dump on it or something. And also, there's no reason at this point, if it's all in the same system already, to go through the IP and TCP layers again. Instead, you can use Unix sockets and a nullfs. So you have a, null, a directory in the uh, so you have a directory in the HA proxy jail with a subdirectory for each jail wanting to be reachable through the HA proxy. And then you can have there the sockets per jail in a subdirectory. And this subdirectory is mounted into the um, into the service jail, something like an engine X or whatever running in there, or PHP FPM. Yeah, I do the same. Yeah, I do the same thing with my next files oh, actually. Yeah, uh, nifty. So Redis. Of that. Yeah. Yeah, Redis works also. So, and something else, which is really nice to, once you have it all figured out, is that you even across jails, as long as you have consistent UID and uh, GID allocation, so consistent user and group IDs, um, you can use the Unix socket authentication in things like Postgres even across jails. So basically something your Postgres server would just ask the kernel, what's the effective user and group ID of the process I'm connected to? The kernel tells Postgres, for example, and then you can have a regex matching its uh, username uh, reverse lookup against the user. So basically you have okay, the root user maps to the Postgres user, everyone else maps to the same user. So only an exception for the root user, so that that's the Postgres super user as well. And then you don't use have to even care about shipping passwords anymore because there are no passwords. There are only credentials on Unix sockets. 
You've so opened you... a cool can of worms there. Do you have any examples or snippets or? Sure, uh, I do have. <laughs> that's it, how... it can be for a future call, but that's that yeah, but... interesting. Um, and yeah, briefly... I can show you. I can show you some uh, what I what I do. So, uh, what's also nice oh. about HA proxy is that it can be dynamically reconfigured by just adding to a map at runtime over a socket where you just tell it basically, oh, you have this new uh, host and this is the backend for it. You can do it all at runtime without downtime. Just put it in a directory and then use a HA proxy map to uh, connect the single front end per port to the per host or per SNI name um, backend. Does HA proxy do termination? It can, yeah, but it doesn't have to. It can also inspect the SNI uh, value so that you can basically accept the connection, we, uh, inspect the first few kilobytes of the connection within the first five seconds, and if it's a TLS handshake, dispatch on the, the SNI um, name, and just forward the buffered few kilobytes of a connection for, so that you can basically have, without decrypting the traffic, inspect just enough of the traffic to understand which destination host so that you can have multiple end-to-end -end encrypted TLS services under a single IP address. Interesting. I pitched my wagon to Varnish, so I hope I didn't Va make a mistake there. Varnish is... Uh, it took <laughs> Vanish is a nice tool, but it solves a different purpose. But you wouldn't use both. You would. You would? Huh. You would. All right. Well, I guess I need to read up on that. Vanish is a reverse proxy, especially a cache. HA proxy right. is mostly a load balancer and routing logic. So basically, it does not cache. It only decides what goes where and which downstream services are healthy. Whereas Varnish uh, can be configured to basically cache everything in memory which is worth caching. Do you do you run the internet, Jan? Like, why, why? How do you know about all this stuff? Um, sleepless nights. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, well, gosh, it's late. I got to get out of here. Before over the years. <laughs> Jan is the internet. That's curiosity. I know. Can you be a new network interface type? We just drop into the VM. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. If you have a syntax example, that would be awesome, too. For what? You had this... We discussed so many things. I know. So, uh, the idea that HA proxy is having a subdirectory for Unix sockets for each jail and um, magic happens and you maybe skip TLS because, hey, it's all internal to the sync kernel, but don't listen so, to the zero and oh my gosh. Man. It's just a null mount, right? Or are you exactly. Something, it's something a, else? it's yeah. a directory containing directories to be null mounted. And then you can just use regular Unix permissions to share those with uh, your jail Not just buddies. can you use normal Unix permissions to control who even gets to connect to those. But right. even if multiple users are allowed, let's say you're using a group, a Postgres client, and you have to be a member of this group to connect, okay? But there may be one uh, application here um, running as this user ID and another application running as another user ID, both in the group, but they are supposed to have access to different Postgres databases in the same server. So using different Postgres roles, so as different users inside Postgres as well. Really nice. Really nice. nice, I think. 
That's good. I haven't, I haven't, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done, uh, but you know, if you're done, fully done embracing clever JS stuff with, uh, why would you have such a big Postgres server? Why not have lots of small Postgres servers for each tenant its own instead of having a big secure database server? Well, it's sure not like you have to license it. end of that question. Hmm? Yeah, there's, there's probably, um, uh, optimization questions on either end of that. Yeah, there is. So uh, let me check. Well, it's, it actually, I gotta, get, I gotta get out of here. Okay. Super quick question. This you mentioned great. that an unrestricted network stack is fastest, then an alias, and then between like NetGraph so, um, and uh, Net. Which would, how would you rank those? I haven't been able to measure. Socket. A difference between unrestricted and alias. It's just that in theory there should be a tiny overhead for having okay. an alias IP address. But it's so small that at least for the something like iPerview, it's within the noise. Right, right. And VNet can have it depends if you give VNet its own uh physical 10 gig network interface, then there won't be any overhead. If you have a virtualized network inside there in software, then there is overhead. <laughs> okay, so VNet versus right, NetGraph, is one inherently faster or slower than the other? In theory, not Dude, in reality, so you will almost always have to use some kind of software bridging or e pairs to connect the two vnets so the host and the jail vnet so then it's always slower cool. if you have a really nice network card with enough uh virtual functions so that you can have let's say 64 virtual function and the physical function the host uses the physical function the jails use virtual functions you have 64 or less jails on your host. In that case, you can do it all in hardware and there may not even be any uh, performance impact from using sure. VNet in this case. Ask Antrenik uh, when he has time to benchmark the system. Okay. Which he just acquired. Yes, although there might be pressure to move again to on that for reasons on application compatibility. So that's a different conversation. Um, I will throw it out there just in case the world doesn't hear it. Thank you, Jamie, for working on the JL manual page. And I checked the the escapes from the last call or two, and it looks like no one's commented since you commented, Jan. I hope those are making progress for 14. Anything else at this time? We covered a lot of ground, good ground there. I never know where we're going to go with this, but it's always wonderful. Okay. Um... And there will so, be an open ZFS uh, production users call in a few hours. Yeah, so let's Two hours. check here. Oh, I have... Syntax from what you, what you so got. this is would be an, a front end listening on port eighty oh, using okay. H a proxy. Then you get a map definition, which just is a basically um, in this case the host header uh, mapping to um, a back end, and let's just. Uh, which one I can can I show uh, this on here? Take care, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, and this would basically be as simple as this. The backend is only busy with host name to IP address again. And the important part is that they are tied together through a map because maps can be updated using the a control socket without downtime. Uh, yeah, the Ansible managed is just a comment, just deleted. It's 
just to keep people from messing up the uh, template output. Okay. Um, Here. Um, yeah. Last so, comment um, about dynamic. Hmm? You had a comment there about dynamically managed. Yeah. Um, it, you can uh, just reload the uh, map definition at runtime. Uh, Whereas please. if you had a long chain of if else is in there, it would be harder to update the configuration at runtime if you want to make it basically HA proxy as a service where you have a script or whatever or an Ansible uh, role to register a new backend. And that like, would be the I, HA proxy map can be updated yeah. at runtime? Okay, thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> So uh, here, let's check this here looks about right. An introduction, how this would work. You can have a map file, yeah. Editing the file, yeah. Maps, okay, that's new territory. And the, exactly, the runtime API would be the dynamic. Well, there you go. And HI proxy can be used either as just a TCP load balancer, which would be the simplest configuration. It can be an HTTP load balancer for plain text traffic. It can terminate the TLS encryption of HTTPS connections and then also do all of its HTTP magic. Or it can only inspect the TLS handshake to route to the right backend based on the SNI um, host name. The last configuration is nice because then you only inspect the start of the TLS connection without ever having to um, decrypt it in the load balancer. So yeah, there is no plain text going through the load balancer in that case. You still have full end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah. Okay, let's perhaps call it there and yep. perhaps meet in a few hours and tomorrow and in Portugal. Excellent, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm. UTC. Okay, great. Talk to you soon. What you. time will it be? 11 p.m. local or something? Uh, let's see. It is 11. Just under two hours. Yeah. If you can make it. No worries. No pressure. I'm trying to say. Okay. okay. I'm going to call it quick to yeah. have some lunch. <laughs> okay. See you in a few hours. Take care. Bye.